Hello, Mike. And thank you. And hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Broken Bread, which is brought to you by Mike Coles at newliferadio.co.uk in Exeter and me, Ron Bailey, at biblebase.com in Reading, both in the United Kingdom. And we are in the midst of a series of studies based on a book that I wrote some years ago called The Better Covenant. And we've come to study number six, which I'm calling Departure, The Promise. Let's make a start. We always start with an introduction and almost always with this little phrase, context, context, context. In other words, who wrote this? To whom was this written? What was the context of the people who received it? What was the context of the person who wrote it? What was the purpose for writing this? What was the expected end product of this interchange? All these things are important and all these things are really helpful in us understanding an overall basis of the truth, not just isolated verses, which can in their place be a great blessing to us, but to give us a great sweep of the redemption revelation of God and his wonderful purposes that is worked out. This is an astonishing book that God has trusted into our care, and I want to dig into it a little bit more deeply with you in these times we spend together. So this is study number six, Departure, The Promise. We're in the books of Moses, which are called the Pentateuch. That simply means that there are five of them and were written by Moses. Um, obviously, the last chapters of Deuteronomy speak of his death, so he didn't write those parts. But they are key books, and we need to ask this question, why were they written? And let's ask the question, who wrote them? Well, we've just answered that, Moses. But to whom were they written? And this really is very important when it comes to us understanding the nature of the book and the purpose of the book. Because these five books of the Old, of the Covenant were written in, really in order to give the background, the backdrop, the context for the whole of what we call the Old Testament story. Let me explain what I mean. If you start off in Genesis chapter 1, in the first chapter, it speaks of God. It uses the term Elohim, which references a God of power, of might, who creates the world and all that's in it. Then in chapter 2, you have part of that story repeated, but God's name is given. It speaks of Jehovah. Now, Elohim is a kind of a title and a description, but Jehovah is the personal name of God. So you come into chapter 2 and you begin to speak of Adam and Eve and God's relationship with mankind, and you've got this thing coming in of a relationship. So that seems to link to this name of Jehovah. And as we go through the scriptures, we find that we get an understanding, a feeling for who this person is, who has chosen to call himself Jehovah. And it's all about a covenant. It's all about a time when God drew a company of people into a certain place and spoke to them and entered into a covenant with them. And the result of that covenant was that God and that people became intimately united. They became one. God begins to be called Jehovah, Israel's God. They could say, he's ours. He's no one else's God. He's ours. And God could say, you're mine. You belong to nobody else. It's this wonderful word, his. God could say, we could say of him, we're his. And he could say of us, you work it out. <laughs> here's, here's my little introduction then. 
to each book of the Bible. Genesis, which means the beginning, it's an introduction to the parties to the Sinai covenant, which would come quite a long time afterwards. Exodus means departure, and that comes to the place of Sinai. About half of the book has to do with the Exodus coming out of Egypt, but the larger half of the book has to do with the covenant. It has to do with a relationship that God entered into and the terms of that, the privileges and the obligation. Then the third book, Leviticus, pertaining to the Levites, or really better, the priests, they were to be the guardians. They were to be the, the ministers of the covenant. Then Numbers is the book which is a disaster. It's called Numbers because it, there are two numberings of Israel, one in, uh, in one chapter, Numbers chapter 1 and the other one in Numbers 26, but there's 40 years of wilderness in between. But the fifth book of Moses is called Deuteronomy. That was things that Moses said when they were right on the threshold of the promised land, 40 years later um, than what had happened at Sinai. And that becomes shows the covenant as the tenancy agreement. It becomes the basis upon which they would hold the tenancy of the land. If they kept the covenant, they would keep the land. If they broke the covenant, they would forfeit the land. So these five books of the Bible are all about the covenant. Genesis, it's about the parties of the covenant. Exodus, it's about the creation of the covenant. Leviticus, it's about the people who administered the covenant. Numbers, the disaster. Deuteronomy chapter 5, the covenant as a tenancy agreement. And it becomes the center of gravity of the Pentateuch, which is really the law. The Sinai covenant lasted for about 1,530 1, years and is, is the backdrop to all of the events of the Old Testament or covenant. From Exodus chapter 24 right through to John chapter 19. Let's put those two passages together. Exodus 24 verse 6 following. And Moses took half of the blood. This is more Moses instituting the covenant. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. And half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant, more about that later, and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Jehovah has spoken will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Jehovah has made with you concerning all these words. If you go through to the book of Hebrews, you'll find that Moses sprinkled the blood on the altar, the people, and the book. Those three united together. But then there's a gap of 1,530 years duration. And you come to John chapter 19. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It's finished. What was finished? Well, lots of things were finished. His messianic work was finished. His fulfilling the will of God was finished. The payment for sin, the debt was paid, it was finished. And the old covenant instituted by Moses was finished. It all came to an end and a new prospect opened out. In the American Standard Version of 1900, when you get to the New Testament, this is its opening page. The New Covenant, commonly called the New Testament. There was a very famous English uh, evangelical scholar, very, very highly regarded scholar named F.F. F. Bruce. And he used to say that it was really a tragedy that our New Testament had become called the New Testament because it's not a testament, it's a covenant. And he's making a point that what we call the Old Testament are actually the writings written by a man 
of the Old Covenant for the people of the Old Covenant. Yes, even Genesis, written for the people of the Old Covenant, to explain to them who they were, what their origin had been, oranges, origins had been. And the New Covenant, the New Testament, well, that was written by people in the New Covenant for people in the New Covenant. This is a great theme. But we won't pursue it just now. The book of Exodus, incidentally, is known simply because it's as Exodus, simply because it's one of the words departed, which is used in Exodus chapter 16. It's, um, it, it's, a, it's a good word. And it's used in an interesting place in the story that you have in Matthew chapter 18 of what we call the transfiguration. And it says that they, that's Elijah and Moses, appeared in splendor and spoke about his, that's Christ's, decease, some of the old versions say. It's actually the word translated exodus, his departure that he was about to carry out. That's actually the word to accomplish. So there was going to be an exodus that he would accomplish. Moses accomplished an exodus. Jesus would accomplish an exodus. There's a pattern here. There are two covenants, says Paul, right into the Galatians. In this sense, there are just two. The new covenant is not comparing itself with the Adamic covenant or the Abrahamic covenant or the Davidic covenant or the Levitical covenant. It's comparing itself with the Mosaic or the Sinai covenant. I want to go on to these three sections, although we'll only do the first one tonight. I want to talk about God's self-revelations. I don't know whether you've ever been into those kind of situations where you're perhaps with strangers in a room and someone says, well, just just take a couple of minutes just to introduce yourself, will you? And I, I think, now what do we say? <laughs> um, this is God, self-revelation. Who are you? He says, well, I'm Jehovah. You say, well, what do we know about Jehovah? Well, Jehovah will be revealed by his words. His character will be revealed by his actions. He will be revealed by his faithfulness. So this word Jehovah begins to be the name which evokes in us a consciousness, a memory, and a trust in a God who is faithful, covenant-keeping, honest, true, in every way, utterly reliable. God revealed himself with this name, El Shaddai, which is, El, is, is translated as God Almighty, is really a description or a title. But Jehovah isn't a title, it's a name. This is God's name. This is who he is. And if you say, who is Jehovah? Well, you have to listen to the things he says and observe the things that he does. This is God's self-revelation to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. And he said unto him, I am. Um, this is God speaking to Moses. I am Jehovah that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. I want you to notice how these promises, these covenants made with these three patriarchs, as they know, all have to do with the land. I am Jehovah that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Then 150 years later, God speaks to Jacob and says, it says, Behold, Jehovah stood above it and said, I am Jehovah, the God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And then 270 years later after that, wherefore, this is Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, wherefore say to the children of Israel, I am Jehovah, and it's this key passage that I want us to look at. 
I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So in Genesis, God self-revealed himself by the phrase, I am Jehovah, twice. But in Exodus and Leviticus, God revealed himself by the phrase, I am Jehovah, almost 70 times. And you can actually, with some Bible study helps with your computer, uh, work out just how frequently that little phrase, I am Jehovah, is used. And if you do, you'll see that it's heavily concentrated on Exodus and Leviticus. In other words, it's this passage of Scripture that has to do, in the Pentateuch, that is, um, with the covenant. So let's have a look at one of these sections. This is Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. And Jehovah said unto Moses, now thou shalt see what I will do to Pharaoh. For by a strong hand shall he let them go, and by a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Jehovah. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob as God Almighty, that's El Shaddai. But by my name Jehovah I was not known to them. Now, how can this be? Because we know that to both Abraham and to Jacob, God said, I am Jehovah. So how can this passage say, I was not known to them as Jehovah? Well, you can know someone's name without knowing the person. You can know someone's name, and that may be the beginning of a relationship and a conversation. And later on, that name isn't just a label. it becomes. Well, something which even the speaking of that name um, can evoke all kinds of things. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. There's nothing magic in the name of Jesus. It's who we know Jesus to be. It's all the activity that we connect to the person of Jesus that gives value to the name of Jesus. And although God had addressed himself as I am Jehovah to both Abraham and to Jacob, they never knew him in this particular way of the covenant-keeping God. I have established my covenant with them to give them the land. There's that link always with the covenant with these three men with the land, the land of their sojourning, wherein they sojourned. And moreover, I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. That's God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob, and because he remembered it from them, he acted in the era of these their descendants far later. And it's showing that the covenant that God had with Abraham is distinct from the covenant that he was going to make with the people of Israel. This is important to remember this. And Paul says in his letter to the Galatians that the, the covenant of Sinai covenant was added temporarily until the siege had come to whom the promise was made. So these are different covenants. One prepares the way for the other, but there are different covenants. The earlier covenant was a promise for their descendants, the seed through which the seed would come. God had come to begin the fulfillment of that promise and covenant. The covenant with the seed would be far greater than just a piece of real estate, just a piece of territory. God's relationship with these that he was going to enter into covenant with would not just be about a land. It would be about a people who, in a unique way, would be his. Although all the nations of the earth are mine, God says, you will be to me a unique people. You will be my people. We'll need to expand that later. God's relationship with the seed was to bring them into a unique covenant. They would be fused into one nation, and that nation would become collectively the people of God. And God would become 
This is a title that's used so often in the Old Testament, Jehovah, Israel's God. In our modern version, we usually just have the word, uh, the Lord God of Israel, and we string it all together. But it's, um, it's much more wonderful than that. It needs to be savored. Uh, Jehovah, Israel's God. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the God who entered into a unique relationship with the people of Israel, into an exclusive covenant that would separate that nation and its destiny from all the other nations of the earth. Let's go on, because there is a, an amazing passage of Scripture that I want us to look at here. And it's Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. And this is the message that God is give, giving to Moses, that he is to take to the elders of Israel um, as the, in the opening of the deliverance which would make it possible for them to come to Sinai. Well, just listen to it here. Therefore say unto the children of Israel, I am Jehovah. This is how God begins. Say, say to them, I am Jehovah. And then you've got seven I wills, seven glorious affirmations, proclamations, statements of God's determination. Listen, listen to them. Uh, we'll go through them one by one. Here's number one. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Number two. And I will rid you out of their bondage. Number three, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Number four, and I will take you to me for a people. Number five, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am Jehovah your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And number six, I will bring you in to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And number seven, I will give it to you for a heritage. I am Jehovah. So these are the seven I wills of the Sinai covenant. And you can put them under different heads. Some of them relate to God's, some of them relate to the Exodus, God bringing them out. Can you see those first two there? I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The, the weight, the pain, the suffering, the iron furnace that they were in, they were trapped in this situation. I will rid you out of their bondage. They weren't just going to break free. They were going to break out of their bondage. What I mean by that is that they would no longer be under the authority of Satan, of Satan or of Pharaoh in that sense. And I will redeem you. There's a lovely word. I will redeem you. This is the word that speaks of a purchase price being made so that there can be a change of ownership. And we'll talk about that later uh, because that too is key. But these are wonderful pictures. I'll bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I'll rid you out of their bondage. I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And then you come into this next section and I will make you essentially number four and number five or I will make you mine. I will take you to me for a people. You see, the first three of those, the, the, the scene where that, those took place is Egypt. I'll bring you out. I'll rid you out of their bondage. I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm. But the scene of the next two is Sinai. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am Jehovah, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And then We've got a change of the scene again. First scene is Egypt. Second scene is Sinai. Third scene is the land of Israel. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. And I will give it to you for a heritage. So you've got, you've got kind of these three areas. Things that God will do in Egypt. Things that God will do in Sinai. Things that God will do in the promised land. Amazing. And you've got this way in which God puts his name not just at the end of this signing it, but he puts it at the beginning as well. So that the first sentence in this is, I am Jehovah. And the last sentence in this is, I am Jehovah. And it's often occurred to me that if you wanted to make a legal document kind of watertight so that people couldn't add to it, 
A great way would be to sign your name at the beginning of the paragraph and to sign your name at the end of the paragraph. Then no one can take anything out of the middle of it and no one can add anything to the end of it or put it at the front of it. And if you add to that the Hebrew language, uh, um, add no spaces between the words and no vowels in the words, this would lock this statement in so permanently. I am Jehovah. The affirmation of that cover coming. I am Jehovah is the first and last sentence in the promise. Like signing at the start and end of a promise. This is a wonderful praise, and I hope you've already seen the gospel in this, because there are American parallels here. This is Jesus' promise. I'll bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment, and I will take you to me for a people. <laughs> I've brought you to myself on eagles' wings, God said, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know. When you enter into that covenant as a reality, you know, you don't just believe, you don't just hope, you don't just move towards, you know. You, know, you don't know him in all his fullness yet, but you know. I will bring you into a land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Well, he will translate you from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And I will give it to you for a heritage. He will give you your own place in this land in which you can serve him your own allotment <laughs> your own lot given to you, purposed for you that you should serve God in it what an amazing promise this is for these people these people who have known generations only of slavery increasing severity of slavery and now comes this word say to Israel I'm Jehovah I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian and I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments and I will take you to me for a people, not just for individuals now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I will take you to me for a people. This is singularity. This is people being brought together into one body of people. I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am Jehovah, your God. Jehovah, Israel's God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a heritage. I am Jehovah. You seen the link? He has to bring you out so that he can bring you to himself. When he brings you to himself, he has to enter into a covenant with you so that he can lead you into the promised land. Each stage is dependent upon the one before it. I'll bring you out. I'll make you my people. I'll bring you in. There are some amazing parallels here, of course, with the life of the Lord Jesus. That's why I did what I said I would do. <laughs> the new covenant takes the shape of the Sinai Covenant, but moves from shadow to reality, and it fills it with such a wealth, such a, such a glorious wealth. And we see in this Old Covenant something that did happen. It was real for them, but at the same time, it was a shadow. It was a time. It was a template. It was something to give us an idea of the shape so that when reality came into view, we would recognize it as what it was. 
I'm not talking about the old covenant that was Sinai. I'm talking about the new covenant, of which it tells us in Hebrews, he takes away the first, that he may establish the second. The second can't be added to the first. Oh, it learns from it, it uses the language of it, but it's an entirely separate covenant. And we shall discover that as we dig more deeply into it, God willing, in the coming weeks. So it only remains for me to thank you again for spending this time with us and telling you again that you can find all these things on Mike Coles' website and on the Bible-based website and the Bible-based podcasts and all over the place. You can find them. And God willing, we trust to have your company next week. Until then, goodbye.